Right, hello. It's another revision video. Firstly, I'd like to say I'm sorry, because it's supposed to be a revision video every day. This is the first one in four days. But never mind, I'm totally sorry about that. But to be honest with you, the main reason why I haven't done one is because I've been revising. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I don't know whether I got my priorities straight on that one or not, to be honest. But anyway, today we're going to be doing some chemistry. It's a long time I did a chemistry video, I haven't done one this year yet. Um, so that's nice. And this was a request by Josh Phillips. Um, oh, I forgot to bring the message up. But anyway, yeah, he basically said, do some NMR, NMR because I love it so much. And notoriously, well, no, not notoriously, what I'm talking about. I don't really like NMR, or I didn't used to. I think it's probably one of the um, hardest bits in Unit 4, if not the hardest bit. By the way, this is Edexcel A2 chemistry we're doing here but presumably it applies to a whole range of A2 chemistry courses. But I find it really hard finding out, deciphering what bit of the graph does what and what, what actually NMR actually is. What is NMR? Well, so far in chemistry we've seen, you know, how different molecules interact and the mechanisms of each reaction, but how do we know the formulas of these molecules? How do we know that they look like that? NMR. Well, there's a whole range of spectros spectroscopy techniques. That's right. There's mass spectroscopy, um, which gives you the relative formula mass. There's infrared spectroscopy, which involves um, picks out different functional groups within a molecule. The NMR is one which really gives an indication of the structure of a molecule. And NMR stands for Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Spectroscopy, so there's magnets involved. Because it relies on a property that some atoms have called spin. Now spin occurs in atoms with an uneven number of protons and neutrons. Now in normal organic compounds, because this is mainly organic chemistry we're talking about here, that's going to be the normal hydrogen isotope. Carbon-14, the carbon-14 isotope is also one, but obviously that isn't as common as carbon-12. But hydrogen only has one proton in its nucleus and no neutron, so it has an uneven number. So that means it has a property called spin when placed in a magnetic field. The, elect the protons can either align themselves with or against the magnetic field. Um... So that's basically what we're talking about here. We don't need to really know that in that much detail. What we do need to know is how to apply the data from an NMR spectrum and use it to work out the formula of a compound. Um, so, you apply a magnetic field. Then you apply a source of radio waves. Now those radio waves have enough energy for... Um, Hydrogen atoms which don't align themselves with, yeah, hydrogen atoms which are aligned with the field to go against the field. That requires energy, so they absorb the energy carried by those radio waves. So when we look at an NMR spectrum like this, this is an indication of the absorbance um, of radio waves at different chemical shifts. Now, what the what does chemical shifts mean? Well, it's pretty vague really, but it's all measured against a standard reference molecule. That's tetramethylsilane. Tetramethylsilane has 12 hydrogen atoms in its molecule, and they're all in the same environment. So they're given a chemical shift of zero. So, that's something I haven't mentioned. Environment. What do we mean by a chemical environment? Every hydrogen, well, different hydrogens within a molecule will, are surrounded by different molecules, so their environment, which is hydrogen in, is different. Let me give you an example over here. Let's talk ethanol as an example. Ethanol is, of course, the alcohol we drink. Right. How many hydrogen environments are present there? There are three. There's this hydrogen here, 
there's these two hydrogens here, these are in the same environment, can you see that? And these three hydrogens here are in the same environment. Because they're surrounded by the same atoms. So the effect that this carbon has on this hydrogen will be the same as it has on this hydrogen and this hydrogen. This hydrogen, however, has got an oxygen next to it. So the way it acts in a magnetic field is going to change depending on which atoms and how many atoms it's next to, how many hydrogen environments. And that's what chemical shift is. So by looking at the amount of peaks on an NMR spectrum will show us how many hydrogen environments there are. Okay? And it's measured in parts per million and it's given the symbol delta, the Greek letter delta. Um, little delta. It's capital delta is a triangle thing in it. Okay. Now, you can have a simple NMR spectrum, or usually they give you one which is split, where each of the peaks are split. And the way this splitting happens can be explained using Pascal's triangle, but we won't go into that. Um, what, what am I talking about now? So yeah, now today we're going to be doing a question from the January 13 paper, Section C. Now Section C is notoriously the hardest bit in the paper. And what they've sort of given you, they've given you a random organic compound. The first question was to find out the empirical formula. And then they gave you a mass spectrum, and then you can work out the mass formula. Then they gave you an IR. It was a mixture of all spectroscopy, this question. But to give us a clue on what's going on, they've already told us that this organic compound has the empirical formula C2H4O. Actually, they've given us the molecular formula as well, C4H8O2, so it's just double everything before. And we also know from the infrared spectrum that there's an OH group present in the molecule. So that shows that's the functional group of an alcohol. And it's also got a C double bond O group. That's a carbonyl group, characteristic of aldehydes, ketones, carboxylic acids. Now, it could be a carboxylic acid, of course, because it contains both a carbonyl group and, a high, and an alcohol group. Remember, the COOO group is the functional group of a carboxylic acid. But let's see what's going on here. Um, yeah, so they've given us a lot of information. So then they've given you this spectrum, and from that we've got to work out the structural formula. What they've also given you is the relative amount of protons in each environment. So they've labelled all the peaks, so they've given you J, K, L and M. Now normally you'd be able to work out the number of protons in each peak with an integration trace. So maybe in the exam this year they'll give you an integration trace showing you the relative amount. But here they've been quite nice. They've actually told you how many there are in each peak. So, J, there is 1. K, there is 1. L, there is 3. So might as well. So one, one, three, and M is three. Well, that agrees with our molecular formula, doesn't it? Because three plus three plus one plus one equals eight, and there are eight hydrogen atoms in the molecular formula. So then, well, how do we go about from here? So, we know there are four different hydrogen environments. It's seven marks this question, so that's probably the first thing you'd put. Remember, you've got your data booklet as well, and that will give you an indication on different functional groups, given the different chemical shifts. So, I've got my book here. Let me just see what I've written. So, looking at the NMR structure, there are four proton environments, correct. Now, we also need to understand the splitting pattern. What's the splitting pattern? What time are we on? Brilliant. Okay. The splitting pattern gives an indication on, on what the adjacent 
protons are, whether there are adjacent protons on the next carbon atom. This is probably the hardest bit. It's something called the m plus 1 rule. So, if the peak is just one, like L, so this one's not split at all, it's just one singlet, we call it a singlet, there are no protons on the adjacent atom. At M, that's a doublet, that means there's one proton on the adjacent atom. K is another singlet, and J is a quartet. There are three protons on the adjacent atom. So that indicates to me straight away the presence of a CH3 group. CH3 group like that. Now, we know that there's a carbonyl group and an OH group in there. Now, a, a hydrogen atom in an OH group won't have any hydrogens on the adjacent car on the adjacent atom because there's an oxygen there, and that can only form one other bond, which will be with a carbon atom. So one of these singlets will be due to the OH group. The other one will be due, due to the carbonyl group because of that double bond O. The the carbon atom can't bond to anything else. So let's see what I put. The singlet at K says the neighbouring protons on the next carbon atom. There are no neighbouring protons on the next carbon atom due to the M plus one rule. This is quite likely to be the proton on the OH group, as there's only one proton on in that environment. You see what I did there? They've told us there's only one proton in this environment, and there are no protons on the adjacent carbon atoms, so that's definitely going to be due to that OH group. Because there's only going to be one hydrogen in that environment as well. Where's the OH? At L, there is also a singlet. So here, there's only one peak, there's no splitting. There's no suggestion that a carbon atom with three protons is attached to a carbon with no proton attached. That's a good point. In this environment, there are three protons. But there's no protons on the adjacent carbon atom. So this peak is going to be due to the CH3 group. But there are no protons adjacent on the next carbon atom. That indicates to me that this carbonyl group is going to be there next to it. See? Is any hydrogen here, the carbon next to it, there's no hydrogens attached to it, does it? And it, there can't be a hydrogen here because we've got another touch another carbon on there somewhere. So that's the first bit. Now, let's look at M. There are three protons in environment M. And there's one proton, adjacent proton. Now what does that say to you? Well, the three protons suggest to me another CH3 group, so I think that's going to be at the end of the chain. Only one adjacent proton. That would make sense. So what's attached to that then? Because remember, that carbon can make one more bond. It's pretty obvious now, isn't it? It's the OH group. And there you go. Somehow, out of just using little bits of each of the information, we've come up with the structural formula of the compound. You can attack this from a variety of different ways, but if you just write down what you see and what you can derive from what the graph is telling you, you can come to it from all different ways. It will suddenly all click at one point. We know there are three here, there are three here, so there must be two CH3 groups. One at each end. And then here, singlet, no adjacent protons, that must be due to one of the functional groups. So there you go. That's brilliant. <laughs> Have I been out of the picture all this time? I hope not. Anyway, that's it. Hopefully I'll do another one tomorrow. Maybe we'll do some physics tomorrow, that'll be good. But anyway, yes. Thank you. Bye.